Hi, and welcome to the Electronics and Programming Beginner's Guide. Today I want to take the time to answer a question that I got on YouTube from user uh, Manojit Saha. I apologize if I uh, totally butchered that pronunciation. But he was asking about a triac and its thermal properties. How can, you know, at what current can you run the triac uh, without needing a heatsink? And I did answer his question on YouTube, but I wanted to take the opportunity to make a really detailed answer to, you know, really pull together exactly what I said in the comment. And of course, I want to take the opportunity to show you how you actually do thermal calculations on components. To be able to carry on the conversation about thermals and you know, components, well, first we have to uh, understand the anatomy of a component. So let's start with, this is uh, the die. Uh, the die is what all the circuitry is on, and if you just have a simple BJT or a diode, the die is large but simple. If you have a voltage regulator or you know the, a microchip, uh, the stuff on the die gets uh, more complicated, but let's say, think of the die as like a wafer, which it technically is, uh, that's, you know, it, it's got some dimensions and this is where all the stuff happens. Now the die has to electrically connect to the outside world and for other than things like flip chips and some other odd packages, which I'm going to go over a, a TO220 uh, type package, so you need leads to connect the uh, die to the outside world. And in the case of a TO220, you have three legs that come out of the package. Now, the way the legs attach to the actual die can vary. I believe that in uh, high power type packages, uh, the legs could actually come all the way out here and be uh, welded directly to the die. Uh, in other packages, uh, you can have a bond wire uh, go from the leg and kind of go whoop and be welded onto the uh, die somewhere or something like that. Uh, chips, which are very low power, uh, like microchips or low power packages, tend to use the bond wires, whereas uh, very high power packages could actually bring the uh, leads here all the way in and stick them down in place on the die. Now in a TO220 package, uh, you have what's often referred to as the tab. The tab is that big metal piece on the back. The tab in this case is generally used for heat sinking uh, because the tab is large metal, but there are some TO220 packages that don't have a metal tab. They still have a tab, it's just not metal. By the way, the die is attached to the metal tab. Uh, how it's attached varies from component to component. Uh, in some components, uh, Triax for example, it's often that the die is uh, insulated from the tab, meaning the tab is not electrified. In other components, uh, such as voltage regulators, the tab tends to be attached to the ground terminal. Uh, of the voltage regulator. But uh, the uh, die is attached to the tab for uh, thermal properties because uh, the tab is much larger and it's able to pull heat away from the uh, die. And then finally, uh, once the die is attached to the tab, the whole thing gets encased in black plastic. Said I'm not uh, an amazing artist, so uh, this looks kind of crude but you get the general idea of the anatomy that you find inside one of these packages. So now that we have the basics down, we can go ahead and talk about uh, thermals. <clears throat> the idea of thermals is that uh, it's a calculation that you do to see uh, what temperature does your device get to and is that a safe temperature? Does anything else need to be done to mitigate the heat? There are lots of ways to look at how um, thermals work, but I really like the constant current type model. So that's the one that makes the most sense to me. How does the constant current type model work? Well, your device, the thing that's making all the heat, is a constant current device. 
like that. Then uh, all of uh, the things in line are uh, the, the thermal resistances are the parts and pieces of the uh, device. And so what you end up getting is a constant current device into a resistor, into a resistor, into a resistor, and then to ground. So the ground here it basically represents a zero degrees uh, Celsius, and each resistor here represents something in the thermal path uh, from the device, which is, is which is effectively the constant, uh, which yeah, I guess, which is the constant current source, and these are all the pieces. So uh, the idea here is each resistor is what's called a thermal resistance, that something resists the flow of heat. Uh, if you then calculate the voltage drop across each resistor, that is the temperature rise uh, of that particular device, and then uh, kind of like voltage drop works in a regular circuit, each voltage drop can be added together to see how far the location here is above zero degrees Celsius to then find out what all of your temperatures are and whether or not you've exceeded the uh, temperature that the device is rated for. Now that we uh, have a, a reasonable understanding of the model of how thermals are calculated, we can take a look at an actual example. Uh, in this case, we'll be looking at a BT-136, it's a triac. And the first thing that we're going to look at is, on the data sheet is the T uh, the subscript little j. What a T little j is, uh, is the data sheet telling you what is the maximum temperature that the die can tolerate. Uh, this is sometimes referred to as the junction temperature or operating junction temperature, etc. But what the data sheet is try, uh, trying to tell you with TJ is that do not get the hot die, you know, the thing on the inside, any hotter than, in this case, it's 125 degrees Celsius. And so now that we know uh, what the uh, maximum junction temperature is, we can uh, fill in a few things. The first being is that the temperature here, or the voltage, whatever you want to call it, should be no more than 125 degrees C, like that. Uh, then we can start filling out the rest of the things. For instance, the next thing to look at are the uh, thermal properties of the device. Uh, the one particularly that we want to look at is the uh, junction to ambient uh, temperature or, or a thermal resistance. And in this case, uh, that thermal resistance is a 60 K per W. Now, what does that mean? In this case, K per W is referring to Kelvin per Watt. And uh, if you're thinking about resistance, uh, you always think about, you know, a natural resistor in ohms, but in ohms, it's actually uh, what, uh, volt per amp. Uh, no, amp per volt, you know, I over uh, V. To do no, it's volt per amp. Oh, sorry, I'm screwing up my calculation. Yeah, it's uh, the resistance is actually volt per amp, and so uh, the, uh, in reality, uh, thermal resistance works in a very similar fashion. It's Kelvin per watt. But what the hell are we going to do with Kelvin? You know, it's a temperature that nobody really uses. Well, the dirty secret of Kelvin <clears throat> is that one degree Kelvin, the, the amount of temperature that goes when you uh, go one degree Kelvin, is exactly equivalent to one degree centigrade. The only difference between uh, centigrade and Kelvin is their zero points are in different locations, but the span of the degree is exactly the same. So uh, because uh, the thermal resistance here, this is a relative Kelvin, meaning that this Kelvin doesn't have a preset zero point, it just tells you the temperature rise. This Kelvin is exactly interchangeable with uh, the Celsius here. 
And so we've got one thing filled in. Uh, the next thing is we actually need to get rid of one of these resistors because go like that. Uh, because the thermal resistance here is a junction to ambient, meaning uh, everything else is skipped. This is effectively uh, what the data sheet gives you is the free air uh, the thermal resistance of the device. The next thing that we need to look at is your ambient. And uh, this is very, very important to understand. And that is the junction temperature here is uh, given as the temperature uh, above zero, but that includes ambient. So what does that mean? Well, uh, a common ambient to use is 25 degrees C, which is you know roughly room temperature. So if I go 25 degrees C, like that. And this is technically a voltage, so this is gonna be minus plus like that but 25 degrees C describes the ambient temperature that the device would be in and 25 C is normal room temperature but uh, let's say you have your device in a case in a box that it's in well 25 you know when you first turn the thing on and it's been sitting all day long 25 degrees C might be true, but once heat starts to dissipate inside your uh, device, this may actually go up because your box may not have the necessary thermals to shed away all that heat. So when you're looking at ambient, please be aware of where your device is mounted. And now that we have all of our parts and pieces, we can actually go ahead and do a calculation. And, and that is that uh, the voltage drop across here and here must add up to 125 degrees C. And so you can write this formula as 25 plus 60 times uh, the uh, current going through, which was uh, watts, and let's just use a W. must be equal to 125 and this equal to here uh, would give you if you solve this for the equal to would give you the worst case scenario meaning that although this is the wattage at which the temperature hits exactly 125 degrees uh, but normally you would, uh, would want to give yourself some overhead and so uh, what this gives you is you know the to the absolute maximum, but uh, if your wattage is less than that, you're obviously going to be at a lower temperature. <clears throat> and so to go through and uh, solve this, we can, you know, move the 25 to the other side, so you get 60 uh, times W equals 100, and so then W equals 100 over 60. 60 or 1.6 so from this calculation we can see that our device can at most dissipate 1.6 uh, watts of heat if it is in 25 degrees C ambient temperature and uh, from this calculation you can see uh, how much uh, this can actually change depending on your ambient. And listen, this is the thing I was warning you about. Please be very careful with ambient. And so let's, as an example, let's say our ambient is 50 degrees C, which is, you know, pretty toasty, but uh, let's say the industrial environment generally will give you a uh, ambient of 85 C to work at. And so if we redo this, we end up having, um, do, 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 let's go like this, do, 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 50 like that. So this ends up being 75, this ends up being 
75 and I did not do the calculation off the top of my head, which I'll probably do when the shot changes, but uh, this now drops down to like 1.2-ish, something like that. And so you can see how much uh, the ambient here affects what wattage you can dissipate. And so I did the math in the background, I was quite close, it's actually 1.25 watts. But when compared to the 1.6 watts you were able to dissipate before, this is about uh, 80%, it's actually about 78% of the 1.6, and so you lost 20% of thermal capacity. And so now uh, we have to take this calculation and bring it all together. And for the BT-136, to bring it all together, they have this great chart. Not everybody has a chart like this. A chart like this is, you know, very desirable. But what the chart shows is your uh, thermals uh, versus your current and the curves that bring them together. The first thing to understand are all of the lines that come across here and what those lines are are the different conduction angles. What that means is that uh, if you're using the device as an on-off switch, uh, you're going to use the 180 degree conduction angle because you're going to be conducting on both, both of the positive and the negative wave and the way this chart tries to represent that is if you look at the top there, you see the wave and then you see the alpha that's showing you uh, the degrees of the waveform. And so uh, 180 is full conduction, so uh, through each part of the wave. If you're using the triac uh, to do other things like dimming, etc., you could theoretically use one of the other curves. The issue is that uh, when you're talking about a dimmer, a dimmer could be set infinitely anywhere between the, let's say, the 180 and the 30 degree <clears throat> conduction angles, but you can still get a conduction angle of 180, and so in those kinds of cases, you always want to do the calculation at the worst case scenario. And in this case, the worst case scenario you would be 180 degrees. The only time you would use any of the other conduction curves uh, are when you specifically have a device which is hard set to use one of the other lower ones. If it's not hard set, if it's variable, you can always get to 180 and then poof, your device bursts into flames and you know, lets all the uh, blue smoke out. And so now looking at the chart, we can figure out uh, what uh, current we can uh, put through the device while still staying within the thermals. And at the 25 degree C, our calculation showed that we can put 1.6 watts through the device. And so on the left hand side of the chart here, if you uh, find 1.6 and you follow it through until you meet the uh, 180 degree conduction angle and then you work your way down, what you see is you can do, I don't know, about 1.2, 1.3 amps continuously. Uh, if you uh, drop down to like the 1.25 that we had before, you're, you know, at about an amp, maybe a little less, and that's how this chart will then tell you what your current, uh, what current you can use for the device. But uh, that only gives part of the story because that's the story for the uh, dissipation of the device in just ambient. But what if we add a heatsink and we can do that calculation as well? When you get a heatsink, uh, this is now what your thermal, thermal model looks like. Down here we still have ambient and let's say we're going to use the ambient of uh, 25. So plus minus 25 degrees C. <clears throat> if we again look at the data sheet, uh, we can see that the uh, thermal resistance of the uh, junction uh, is a 3 uh, Kelvin per watt, but that's at the 180 degree conduction angle, and so it's at I always you know, do it at the worst possible uh, case scenario, and so this is going to be 3 
And then uh, this down here, uh, I guess, Kelvin per watt. And this down here is your heatsink, but we really haven't selected the heatsink, and so we can call this X. And once we uh, select the heatsink, we can do uh, some other calculations. And so we can now put a formula together for uh, calculating this, which is, again, just general, uh, let's go with addition. And so uh, what we get is uh, 25 plus X times W plus three times W equals 125. And I understand that we do have two variables in the equation, but uh, depending on uh, some heat sinks, we can go ahead and start playing with these variables. Normally, the way you play with variables like this is you know how much current that you want to pass through the device, but you want to know what size heat sink you need to pass that current. And so if we bring this chart up again, we can see that uh, the maximum current the device can pass is 4 amps and at a 180 degree conduction angle if you come up the chart and then follow it over to the left we can see that uh, 6 watts is what we're going to be dissipating and so if we remove the chart now we now know that this W here is going to be 6 Just like that. And so now we can uh, put some numbers together for what we're doing. And so uh, x plus, um, oops, x times 6 uh, plus, what was it? This is 18 equals 100. And now we can move the 18 to the other side. We get x times 6 equals will that be 90 so this would be 82 and then x equals 82 over 6. and so now through the magic of television we know that uh, this is about 13.6 <clears throat> And so what the calculation tells us is to be able to pull, uh, to, uh, to pass the full four amps of current through the device, our heat sink has to have a thermal resistance of no greater than 13.6 K per watt. Maybe I should put that on there. K per watt or uh, the C per watt, meaning Celsius per watt. As I mentioned, those two things are completely interchangeable and so now you can go on digikey and you can do a parametric search and look for t to uh, to 220 heat sinks and be able to go ahead and uh, pick out a heat sink that oh i want a heat sink that has uh, you know this thermal resistance or less the other thing that i wanted to note here is that all of the calculations that we did here are for uh um, ambient temperature well duh as we said ambient temperature uh, but the other thing is that all of these calculations are just for a uh, convection type flow meaning that you have a heat sink sitting in steady air and as the heat sink heats up it heats up the air around it and the air will convect around it when you get into a, a forced convection meaning a fan or something along those lines uh, the calculations more or less stay the same, but the heat sink selection will uh, start to change. So just wanted to note that. Now I want to go through the same calculations with a different device, something other than the Triac, and I want to use the LM317. which is a pretty handy uh, variable uh, regulator. Uh, so the calculations that we do here uh, uh, apply to many, many other devices. Uh, 
and uh, I'm gonna go through them a little faster. I'm not gonna show any of the graphics, etc. But all of the same kind of stuff still applies. So if you check uh, the data sheet for the LM317, uh, the maximum uh, junction temperature is 125 degrees Celsius, and that goes there. And let's say that we want to pass, uh, uh, actually, let's say a half an amp, so 0 0.5 amps. We want to adjust the voltage down to 5 volts. And uh, we are starting with a voltage of 12 volts that we're going to cut down to five. Like that. From these numbers, the very first thing we can do is we can actually calculate how much wattage uh, this device would have to dissipate. The way this is done is it's basically voltage drop and current, the same kind of wattage calculations you would do with a resistor where when you have your device, let's say this is your device, <clears throat> three terminal device, uh, you know that the output current here is going to be 0 0.5 amps, half an amp. And there may be some current coming down this terminal here, but generally speaking, it's negligible compared to uh, the current <clears throat> uh, that's uh, coming out this way. And so uh, by the rules of that, well, if this current is negligible compared to this current, uh, where uh, the input here is going to be the sum of the output here and the current that goes down this terminal. And so we can then say, uh, because current in a series circuit is the same, that the current over here is going to be 0 0.5 amps. And so the current through the device is you know, the half an amp. So the voltage over here is 12 volts. The voltage over here is 5 volts volts like that and so that means that across this device we are dropping 7 volts so this is plus minus 7 volts and doing that same kind of calculation as we do with resistors we can figure out what the wattage is here and in this case it's going to be 7 times 0 0.5 which it's the current through the, the device times the voltage drop across the device gives us a wattage of, what is that? That's 3.5. And so now that we know that the constant current source is gonna be pushing 3.5 watts uh, through the device. Now, if you look at the data sheet uh, for the LM317 from Texas Instrument, it's really, really confusing. And it's really confusing because if you look at the thermal information table, it's large and there's a whole bunch of things to select. But the things to know for the TO220 package, you have a KCS or a KCT. The KCT is a plastic tab. The KCS is a metal tab. And because the KCS has a metal tab, the thermal properties of it are a lot better. The thermal property that you're looking for specifically is the junction to case bottom, which would be the tab, which would put you right on the metal. And the thermal resistance of that is 0 0.1 degrees Celsius per watt, which is a phenomenal uh, junction to a case type temperature. And so this would be, let's go here, 0 0.1. Uh, then we go to select a heatsink, which would go here, and let's say we're going to call this X. And again, we're going to have an ambient, which is, let's say it's going to be 20, uh, let's say it's going to be 85 degrees C. Because, you know, let's do a calculation whenever the <clears throat> uh, temperature is more industrial. And so what you end up getting is, do, do, do. 85 plus uh, 0.1 times 3.5 plus uh, x times 3.5 equals 125. 
and I'm going to uh, go ahead and do the calculation off screen here. And so X, which is our heat sink in this case, has a needs to have a thermal resistance of a minimum of 11.32 degrees C per watt. If you have a heat sink that's at minimum uh, this thermal resistance, meaning you can always have a thermal resistance that is less than that, which means it's a better heat sink. But uh, at minimum, at 85 degrees C, uh, this uh, voltage regulator will hold a junction temperature of 125 degrees, which again is the absolute maximum junction temperature that you're allowed to have, but it will continue to function like this. And I did most of these calculations kind of at worst case scenario. And uh, we can actually go through and do a similar uh, calculation and we'll do, I'll do most of it off screen. But I just wanna show you what this looks like if we reduce the input voltage from 12 volts, let's say down to nine volts. If we reduce the input voltage, like I said, to nine volts, the voltage drop across uh, our device uh, actually goes down so you would go from nine down to five which is a voltage drop of four volts and it's it would be four times the 0 0.5 which would give you two watts of dissipation and at the uh, two watts if we go through this formula yada 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 you would get an x of uh, 19 point nine degrees C per watt, which is a more manageable heat sink than the 11.32. And kind of the moral of the story is whenever you're dealing with linear voltage regulators, uh, it's best to feed them with the uh, lowest voltage that you can. So if you have a system that has a whole bunch of voltages, uh, it's not a terrible idea to uh, daisy chain the regulators together uh, to get some uh, better thermal properties out of them. So if you have, if you start off with a 12 volt rail and you need a nine volt rail and you need a five volt rail, uh, of course you want to go ahead and double check uh, that you're not overloading anything, but it may not be a terrible idea to feed uh, the, um, 9 volt rail from the 12 volt rail and then the 5 volt rail from the 9 volt rail to kind of daisy chain them together in a row. But the, uh, always go through the calculation. Uh, this has been a basic introduction into uh, doing calculations for uh, thermals on components. So, uh, I only use the TO220 package as an example. There are hundreds if not thousands of other packages out there that require uh, same idea but the uh, other parts and pieces of it are different. For example, surface mount components uh, give you stuff in the squares to uh, the circuit board and that gets nice and confusing or packages that dissipate stuff just through the leads that can get confusing etc but so this has been the primer so that uh, if you go to do a calculation you know uh, where to look at things that if you have any questions or comments you're always welcome to put them down below and thank you for watching